The following program contains issues of a sensitive nature that may trigger or disturb some of our viewers. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Well, hello there, and thank you for joining me for this special edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This past Monday, October the 10th, was World Mental Health Day, and in just a few weeks' time, we begin November, which is Men's Mental Health Month. So here at Telil 24-7, we thought it was another good opportunity for us to shine the spotlight on mental health issues and services, not just here in the Strait area, but across the province. This may impact you, or someone in your family, or one of your friends, or even a close acquaintance that you might have. If that's the case, we will be providing information running along the screen all the way through this show so that you have someone that you can call, that you can talk to, and you can express your concerns, especially if there's any kind of an emergency situation. As well, we're going to spend the next hour talking to several key stakeholders in mental health, both here at home and across the province. You're going to hear a follow-up interview with Kern Nichols. She's the executive director of the Nova Scotia Division of the Canadian Mental Health Association. You'll meet a man from Lewisdale who wants to set up a mental wellness center here in Richmond County. And you're going to hear an update from an Isle Madame resident who was one of our first participants in our mental health awareness panels last year at this time and get an update from him on how his personal journey with mental health and lasting trauma issues is going day by day. But we begin with a newcomer to Telil 24-7. Last year, the Premier of Nova Scotia, Tim Houston, created the first Department of Mental Health and Addictions for the province. And the MLA that he chose to run that department is from not all that far down the road from us. He's the MLA for Cape Breton East, Brian Comer. We spoke to him at his office in Sydney River via Zoom just after the one-year anniversary of the creation of the Department of Mental Health and Addictions. Here's that conversation with Brian Comer right now. You are a bit of a trailblazer here because you are the first minister in this portfolio. It's now the one year anniversary of both the election of the PC government under Premier Tim Houston, but also the one year anniversary of him approaching you to take on this portfolio. What did you think when he approached you and what made you choose to go ahead with this assignment and take it on? Yeah, it's been a, what a year it has been, Adam, for sure. I think, you know, it's a... Uh... A couple thoughts kind of went through my mind. I think when when the premier first asked me, I felt tremendously honored, you know, and, and privileged at the time to kind of uh, be given the opportunity, but also felt a great deal uh, of responsibility. Right, it's a significant issue impacting uh, Nova Scotians, you know, right across the province. Um, so my previous life, uh, I was a frontline psychiatric nurse uh, actually in Cape Breton. So uh, something that actually kind of drew me into to public office uh, first in opposition, and now. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to give him the opportunity to, to be the first minister. Now, what do you feel that one of the more significant changes has been in the way Nova Scotia deals with mental health issues since you took on this portfolio and since a separate dedicated department was put in place? Uh, obviously, we'll be talking about a couple of programs later on in the interview, but what immediately comes to mind in terms of the differences in the way mental health and its various aspects are dealt with in the province these days yeah you know, i've had the opportunity to you know to travel across the province uh, i've been very fortunate you know i've met with you know folks in hospitals you know community-based uh, groups uh people that have experienced loss uh, their own families you know with loved ones and, and friends and uh which is you know often difficult but important conversations to have uh so, sort of something i've been hearing a lot about is people are i think you know, generally uh, appreciative that there's a person that's in charge and person that can be held accountable, right? So, uh, so and I take that very seriously. So, I mean, uh, I think that's probably a significant shift in traditional sort of, uh, you know, government departments where it was all kind of, you know, within the one uh, Ministry of Health, right? So, I think, you know, having the, the Minister, you know, for Addictions and Mental Health, uh, as well as, you know, seniors in long-term care and as well as health and wellness, uh, real, really, uh, allows you to focus on your priorities and get things done quicker. 
Minister Comer, I want to pick up on a comment you made just a moment ago, just in terms of the idea that you reached out to the various mental health stakeholders. Uh, you've spoken to people at different hospitals, at different health care facilities. Were you surprised at all at what you saw and what you heard coming into the portfolio in terms of not just the treatment of mental health, but the difficulties in treating mental health across Nova Scotia? Did any of that surprise you? I would say yes and no, you know, to, to be honest. I think, you know, it's um, speaking with especially some of the coalitions in the province. I mean, the morale was low, I think, at times in some of the, the healthcare facilities that we, we've went into. But gen there's a very general uh, positivity, I think, amongst the clinicians. Uh, I think, you know, community based uh, organizations, especially, really do really incredible work in the province. Uh, so we've met. I think so far with about 80 uh, at this point, and we're kind of looking at how to work with them, to especially how to uh, enhance, you know, your lower tier, mild, moderate sort of services in the province, you know, as, as really true uh, partners in the community. Um, I think, the, you know, you can't really mention too too much about the addictions and mental health without, without mentioning the pandemic as well, right? So uh, we're still kind of early stages, I think, in terms of research and that sort of stuff to see the, the true implications. But I think we've seen, you know, uh, increased kind of presentations to hospital, you know, ERs and, and different sort of uh, situations like that. So it's something we'll definitely keep uh, working on. You mentioned hospitals a moment ago, and one of the things we really did want to speak to you about today is about the rural access to mental health program that your department has launched. Uh, it started as a pilot project at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital, and uh, now it's at St. Martha's Regional Hospital in Antigonish. So can you give us a sense of what the thinking was behind this rural access program, how it differs from what was offered before, and why your department wanted to try it at these two hospitals? Yeah, so I think when you look at kind of how a traditional sort of uh, psychiatric referrals, right, happen from rural emergency rooms, traditionally the other practices, you go to your rural ER, you would see a practitioner who would then kind of consult you to see a mental health professional, often in a tertiary center, right? So this uh, this initiative really allows people to get the treatment in their own community, I think, which is important without leaving the community. Uh, it's more timely access to, to care, right? And, and it also takes away the unnecessary travel burden, right, for people that have to leave their communities to go to a uh, a more centered hospital, uh, which also I think indirectly kind of uh, does help with the EHS strain as well, right? Because often those patient transfers are, are transferred via ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the, the examples in Cape Breton uh, and St. Martha's, uh, we're kind of working uh, towards expansion in South Shore uh, and in the Valley as well. Um, so we're kind of focusing on the areas with the highest need first, uh, and then kind of looking at other, you know, potential expansions from there. Mm -hmm. Do you see a possibility that the program could eventually come to the Straight Richmond Hospital in Evanston or to Inverness Consolidated Memorial Hospital? Uh, many of our viewers would have experience with both of these facilities. Uh, I know you're looking at other parts of the province right now, but but do you see sometime down the road that the program could come to Evanston or to Inverness? Yeah, I think in terms of expansions, right, like this, that we're always looking at how things are changing, right, how, how things, you know, provide opportunities. Uh, I think right now, specifically uh, for Richmond, uh, we're really focused on the Recovery Support Center. Uh, so currently right now with uh, that uh, center, you're, you, you kind of get services, right, with your psychoeducation, like one-to-one -one therapy, group therapy, uh, evidence-based harm reduction. Uh, we did recently uh, successfully uh, get a nurse practitioner actually there to uh, be part of kind of the, the clinical team. Uh, and now the last kind of uh, piece of leg work uh, is to get uh, an increased uh, physician services, right, to really uh, enhance the outpatient uh, substance use uh, clinical treatment. Uh, so I think that's a positive, right, a positive step, and I think in that community specifically. Mm -hmm. Minister Comer, on that note, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between your department and the Department of Health and Wellness, Nova Scotia Health? Because it's one thing to say that mental health needs to be addressed in our province, and it's quite another thing to say that your department needs to work with a department that's currently facing its own struggles in terms of physician recruitment, healthcare professional recruitment, keeping ERs open. What has the relationship been like over the past year between your Department of Mental Health and Addiction and the Department of Health and Wellness? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, it's been very collaborative, I would say, to, to this point. Um, I think one thing that's a bit unique uh, with the addictions and mental health space is we can often do things very nimbly. Uh, like if you, you kind of look at the acute mental health day hospital, 
uh, as an example of a new service in the province or preschool autism supports, uh, sexual violence, trauma therapy, these sorts of programs. Um, they can be very uh, impactful and powerful programs that actually aren't offered in a hospital setting, right? So, uh, but I think there's, we obviously have a strong relationship uh, with health and wellness, uh, especially for our community-based, you know, treatment programs, inpatient mental health uh, programs as well. So I would say it's a strong uh, collaboration. What do you see on the horizon in terms of other projects that your department's working on right now? Uh, what's in the hopper and what's in development in terms of looking at future initiatives for provincial treatment of mental health? Yes, yeah, so we've opened up three uh, recovery support centers so far, right? Uh, one in Dartmouth, uh, one in Glasgow, and then one in Middleton. Uh, so there'll be seven more of those sites that will be opened up over the next two years. Uh, so sort of chipping away at that, really kind of enhancing treatment, uh, especially for substance use issues uh, in communities. Uh, we've had the Acute Mental Health Day Hospital in Halifax. Uh, we're currently looking at a potential uh, expansion for that service as well uh, to other regions of the province. Uh, but I think the most significant aspect is the universal uh, access piece, right? So, so I think uh, my hope is that over the next six to 12 months, Nova Scotians will really see, you know, how the landscape I think is starting to change for addictions to mental health. Uh, with some really innovative uh, programs. And as we're winding down here, Minister, uh, you're talking a little bit about what we can expect to see. What's your overall outlook for what your department is doing, but also the collaborations that you're having with organizations like uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association and people on the ground from one end of the province to the other? Uh, what is your feeling as you look into even just the next year to year and a half? Yeah, I feel very hopeful, you know, to, to be honest. I think uh, it's, a, like it's a tremendous responsibility and people, a lot of people are really hurting, right? I think right now, you know, across the province. Um, I think we're really focusing on early prevention, right? Especially with their children and, and you know, certain um, uh, groups in the province that have traditionally had a difficult time accessing evidence-based care in the province. Um, so I think the, the hope is the landscape will, will shift and, you know, people really see that it really is a priority of not just myself, but I think of the government. All right, we've covered a lot of ground here in a short time, as I thought we might. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add about all this, Minister, just before we wrap it up? No, just that, thanks for the, the opportunity, Adam. I really, uh, really appreciate the time. Brian Comer is Nova Scotia's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. We've been speaking to him via Zoom from his constituency office in Sydney River. Stay tuned for more of Telil 24-7 in just a moment. Many of you may know Tyler Shea of Lewisdale as a singer, songwriter, and performer. But he's also an early childhood interventionist and behavioral analyst who would like to see a new mental wellness center set up here in Richmond County. As a matter of fact, he has spent several months fundraising for this new center idea, and he's going to talk about it with us in a few weeks' time for a special edition of Telil 24-7 that will combine Tyler Shea's music and his mental health philosophies as we begin Men's Mental Health Month in November. But we have some excerpts from that special for you right now, as Tyler Shea explains to us how the concept of a mental wellness center for Richmond County came about and how he would like to see it proceed. Where did this all come from and why do you feel there's a need for a center like this right here? I just would like to see there be a little bit more community when it comes to um, mental health. I want it to be, I want it to become more out in the open and normalized and, and generalized. Uh, you know, I'd like to see it move away from, you know, the extremes where people are really, you know, you know, suffering with a, a diagnosis and, and and become more inclusive where everybody knows how important it is to kind of care for ourselves, our mind and our body in these ways that, you know, promote good mental wellness and, and mental health. I, I have this, this theory that, you know, the mental health crisis is not necessarily being fueled by all of the the outliers 
uh, on the spectrum who are, you know, already have a diagnosis of, or, or I think that the, the general population of people, you know, kind of has a responsibility to work towards being more inclusive. Can you give me two or three other examples of some of the programs that you'd like to see roll out if you're able to bring this to fruition? What are some other examples? Yeah, so um, my real focus is on what's referred to as inner child healing. And that's kind of the big thing where if you remember that quote that I said at the beginning, like yes. how we, uh, you know, try and be open-minded. Yes, you know? to have be open to new ideas and to not simply guard against new ideas by hanging on to old ideas. Right. Yeah. So I have collected a lot of evidence from myself that the root of my anxiety, my depression, all this stuff comes back to my inner child not having certain emotional needs met. And that is a challenging thing to talk about because the soon, as soon as I say that, I know, especially if my parents are, are watching this, mm -hmm. like it's a hard thing to, to hear and reflect on. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very kind of delicate thing to talk about. The inner child and all this you've been speaking of, the window of tolerance is going to be a key part of the concept of the mental wellness center. And I think it's helpful for our viewers to know too that while this is a physical structure that you're hoping to build, mm -hmm. what you're offering goes far beyond the physical. You're offering things like podcasting and you're offering things like, you know, your own music, either playing one-on-one -on -one or playing for, you know, special house parties that are geared towards mental health and mental health issues. Uh, how, how do you feel that integrating these out of the box, out of the physical plant services is going to help people out. Yeah, uh, so a lot of that stuff that I'm planning to do is really geared toward the uh, fundraising aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I hope, and, and to be honest, I haven't been you know, super consistent at, at putting that stuff out there. Sure. Again, you know, I'm, I'm, a lot of this time I've been I don't have it all figured out yet, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants and, and, uh, and, and, and trying to overcome some limiting beliefs still. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, I, I really want to find a way to, you know, put this information out there uh, that's easily accessible for people. I mean, because a lot of this stuff that I, I believe... Um, you know, I, I really do believe that everyone has the potential to kind of be their own self healer. You know? And there's a funny dynamic with this field of, you know, mental health professionals and stuff, because really the whole field, like it exists right now, but the end game should be for it not to exist. Mm. You know what I mean? Which is a strange thing. And I don't know how many people actually talk about that. You know, it's if you have, uh, you know, mental health professionals or anybody like charging for these types of, of, of services. I mean, the end goal is to like to not require to not this require type of service, to not require yeah. it. So, how do we do that? You know, and 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 it, it's a strange place to be because in, in knowing that and wanting to achieve that, I'm I'm setting up you know a, a sort of business to sustain myself knowing that the ultimate goal is for the business like to not necessarily be a business anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how do we, you know, guide people to be their own healers, to be their own support, to be their own. And, 
And that sort of makes it sound like, oh, everybody should do everything by themselves. That's not it at all. I think that when people start becoming their own self healer and, and, and giving and meeting their own needs, we will, you know, almost immediately become a more cooperative society. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, when we meet those needs for ourselves, when we learn the skills to meet those needs for ourselves, you know, we fill up from the inside. Mm -hmm. And then we're not, um, we're not going around you know, and experiencing this, you know, empath burnout that, that a lot of people talk about, you know, yeah. it's like we're going out, we're trying to be good people, we're trying to be kind, mm -hmm. but because we're not filling ourselves up from the inside, everybody's feeling burnt out and everybody's struggling. You almost seem to be going with a bit of a food bank analogy here because, first of all, those that need a food bank are trying to get to a better place in life, but you need to eat first, you need to have nourishment first. And the example I'll use from the Port Hawkesbury Food Bank, when it's set up in 1991, it's now expanding. The two organizers of the Port Hawkesbury Food Bank were interviewed at the time and they were asked, when would you consider your food bank to be a success? And they said, when it closes. Mm -hmm. when we don't need a food bank anymore. So you're going along much the same line in terms of this mental wellness center. It'll, it'll reach its peak of success when it's no longer needed and when people are better able to access what they need. Right. Or when it's, you know, when, you know, the government makes mental health services free across the board for people. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's just something when there is zero you know, obstacles to accessibility. One of the things you would like to do is work to bring a full-time physician to Richmond County as part of this wellness center. So is that something that you would be interested in working on with the Department of Health and Wellness or with the local recruiting navigators for Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health? What was the thinking there? My thinking there is that really what I, I really want to have this space established and up and running. And I would like to, you know, entice a physician, you know, with that by saying like, here's a space, here's just, it's like walk in, walk in ready, you know, set up a practice. But I do have a kind of condition that I want to meet with that. I want to find a physician that will come to the area that believes in the future of psychedelic medicine as it relates to um, you know the men mental health, because um, I, I I want to create uh, you know a ketamine clinic. Uh, I want to be able to uh, you know legally provide psilocybin assisted therapy uh, for people who want to explore that and um, you know. I'll be trained to, you know, you know, to 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 be the guide in those situations, but I won't be a physician, you know. So, I I, I really hope that, I, you know, you know the the ultimate dream of this, if I can see it to fruition, will be to to find somebody that, um, you know, really believes in the things that I believe in. Uh, and that might just want to say, come to Cape Breton mm -hmm. and, and set up shop and, and kind of help me deliver a, a, a service that's really unique to, you know, our area and, you know, Atlantic Canada, er, everywhere. I mean, like there's, there's places like this, but not enough of them, you know. So in that spirit, do you anticipate that you'll be having conversations with officials with the Department of Health, Health and Wellness, or for that matter, the Department of Mental Health and Addictions? Is that something that's in the cards for you? I, I, I'm honestly, I'm open to anything. I can't say that I've, I've, I've thought about that. Uh, and again, like, I, I'm still, I still work through my own limiting beliefs, my own insecurities, uh, and, 
but uh, yeah, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I need to try and stay focused on like the fundraising aspects of, uh, of this and, and raise the money to, you know, create the space uh, and then, you know, open it up to other, you know, health professionals, healers who might want to come in and use the space and do things like, like yoga and, uh, you know, uh, breath work, uh, just different things that are, are, you know, focused on the nervous system and teaching people ways to regulate the nervous system. Uh, and, and that's a really good place to start, I think. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, when I'm ready, I, I hope to be able to to reach out to the people I need to reach out to and 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 make more things happen. It's not a small project. It's a large project. It involves thousands of dollars, and it involves a lot of groundwork on your part. So, what do you think is the biggest motivator for you to see this mental wellness center come to pass here in Richmond County? I've had this strange relationship with motivation, and. I mean, I've been motivated to do this for so long. And I, you know, I go through these periods where I feel really motivated and then I feel less motivated. And part of that is because I recognize that, I recognize times when my motivation to really move forward might be stemming from a place where I'm not recognizing an area in myself that needs healing. And there I am like seeking the external validation by pushing forward and feeling like I need to help other people. I need to help other people. I need to help other people. And then I come back to, I can't help other people unless I can help myself first. Um, and so a lot of the times I kind of get stuck there and, and, and not to say that I that I mind being stuck there because I know like that's the most important thing. Like I can't. That's true for me. I can't help other people if I can't help myself. So, um, you know, I, I I've relaxed more into you know uh, a, a kind of a steady place where I'm continuously self-reflecting and helping myself and. You know, I'm letting everything else, I'm letting the project kind of play out at a more natural pace with less urgency, with less, not that the, you know, not that it doesn't deserve the urgency, mm -hmm. but I find that every time that I give in to that urgency, I avoid like doing the work on myself and then it's this like weird cycle that I that I'm yeah. witnessing so it's I, it's 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 hard to give a, a real answer like I'm just motivated like my only motivation to do anything is really to be my own healer to figure out how um you know um how I can I can foster the relationship with my emotions and regulate my nervous system and then figure out shortcuts for other people to, to, to take if, if they want to take it. That being said, like, I also don't think that there's really any shortcuts to this kind of stuff, no. but you know, and, and so it's, it's really about teaching myself to hold space for myself, which is so, so if I'm holding space for myself, like the deeper I go in myself, the better I will be at holding space for other people. And once again, you'll hear more of Tyler Shea's thoughts and also hear some of his music on a special edition of Talil 24-7 that's coming up in early November to coincide with Men's Mental Health Month. Right now, we'd like to welcome back to Talil 24-7 the Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association's Nova Scotia Division. Karen Nichols was new to her position when we first caught up with her this time last year, but during that time that she's been on board as the executive director for the Nova Scotia Division, there has been a lot going on in the field of mental health, both in terms of provincial and federal government actions, as well as the efforts being put forward by mental health service providers across the province. What does Kern Nichols think about all this? Here's her perspective in an interview I conducted with her at her home in Hoobly, Halifax County, via Zoom just a few weeks ago. 
Kern, thank you so much for joining me once again here on Tell Ill 24-7. Adam, thank you. It's always uh, a pleasure to have a, co a conversation with you and to talk about this topic. It's really important, I think. It is very much so. And it's important to us to get an update from you and from your organization as well, because the last time I was able to talk to you, you had only been on the job for about three or four months. We yeah. spoke to you last November. So let's look back then at the 10 months since then and basically just over a year on the job for you. How do you feel it's gone and do you feel much has changed or improved during the time that you've been the executive director for the Nova Scotia sector of things? I think what's really interesting is um, when I started the role, we started with a new government as well. So it was sort of auspicious in the sense that um, there was a, a, like opportunity, you know, at, at the forefront. Um, I, the first year, you know, as we talked about, I think this whole space is uh, super complicated uh, and convoluted. Uh, it's convoluted for the client, but it's also convoluted for those that are working inside of it because, um, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces. And so I spent a lot of the year uh, learning and listening. You know, every, every single day was a school day for me. Uh, but I was really encouraged and energized by the work, number one, and by the people doing the work, number two. And so in, in over a year, we've sort of um, kind of recalibrated a little bit. We've um, gained a lot of alignment with um, our branches, which is a piece of the puzzle as well. We are, we, you know, I work out of the division, which is responsible sort of the, for the pan provincial work that we do. But we also have three branches throughout Nova Scotia. And uh, we want to make sure that in order to have a voice that has uh, amplification across the province and impact across the province that we're aligned as well. And so it took a little bit of time to get that sort of uh, organized. Um, we've expanded our network. Um, we've kind of come to understand who the, you know, the key players are. We've developed and deepened our relationship with government. And so I'm really, I'm super inspired by the um, compassionate, uh, very talented, smart people that I work with every day. Um, they advocate tirelessly for, you know, uh, housing and um, employment and programming and psychologically safe workplaces, um, all of the pieces that impact us every single day. And so I think, you know, the thing that sort of moved forward for us is really becoming more established in the community more intentionally around the things that we need to do to um, change the landscape for mental health in Nova Scotia. Can I pick up on a point you made just a moment ago about the three branches of the association yeah. in different sure. parts of the province? Are these geographical? Uh, what can you tell me about the three branches? Yeah, it's an interesting. We're, so we're a federated model with the CMHA. What that means is that um, we are aligned by mission and vision, but we may look different uh, you know, across the country and within the province. And so basically um, the division is responsible Typically for, we're, we're a little bit different, but we tend to be responsible for these sort of pan Pacific, pan Pacific, pan provincial programming. And then we've got three branches. One is in Halifax, Dartmouth. One is in Truro and Colchester. And one is in Southwest Nova. And if you spoke to those branches, each one of them would come to you with a series of programs that were quite different, but also at the same time tuned in to the needs of the community. So at the core of what we do, it's sort of building community capacity to manage our mental health journeys. But of course, in Halifax, Dartmouth, that looks different than it would be in Toronto, Colchester, and it looks sure. different than it would be in Southwest Nova. And so that's how we try and work together to sort of um, meet the needs of our, our communities. So here comes the question I think you knew in your heart I was going to ask. Uh, is there uh -oh. going to be a fourth branch serving Cape Breton Island and or <laughs> eastern Nova Scotia in the coming months? Well, apparently there has been in the past. And so uh, that bodes well, I think. Uh, it really comes down to um, uh, kind of community will and intention. And so if there are a group of uh, organizations or folks in the community that want to sort of um, lead the charge, then we are there to support and amplify the work that they do. So we work together to do that. So uh, the door is open is what I would suggest in that situation. And we do have um, a wonderful uh, uh, teammate and, and colleague uh, who is our 
uh, peer support lead, um, Keith Anderson, and he's based in Sydney. And so we've got a sort of a, a, a sort of a center of gravity there in terms of some of the programming that we do. So we're tapped into Cape Breton, but there's certainly more we could be doing as well. Well, in that spirit, I want to ask you about the relationship that the CMHA has with Nova Scotia's first minister of yeah. mental health and addictions, Brian Comer. Uh, he is from Cape Breton. He is riding actually right next door to the riding of our MLA, Trevor Boudreau in Richmond. This has been his first year on the job. Can you tell me what the relationship has been like between your office and that of the minister in the department? Yeah, it's actually been um, quite collaborative. And so Brian started at about the same time I did. And in fact, uh, we um, we sort of shared that story and, and uh, joke a little bit when we first came together in terms of, uh, you know, both of us sort of learning as we go along. Um, I find Brian to be uh, super humble, very authentic, and really wanting to make a difference. And of course, his background, um, you know, being in rural Nova Scotia, in addition to, you know, uh, working in the, the field has made him especially sort of um, sensitive and compassionate to, you know, what we're trying to, to work with. So, uh, so it has been really good. Uh, we mis- initially met formally uh, in November, where he came to one of our branches. We sat down. And we talked about, you know, sort of what our vision was, and then and what his vision was. Um, you know, we had reflected on his mandate letter, uh, and he seemed quite open. You know, he basically took a lot of notes, the same way that I've been doing for, <laughs> for the entire year. But what we did is did do is we established sort of quarterly check ins and meetings so that we can uh, not just sort of uh, talk the talk, but um, you know, move things forward. I found them to be super collaborative. I've developed uh, some really great relationships with a number of people within his department. Uh, I feel like we have kindred spirits. We want the same thing. A lot of the work that we do is really about building community capacity. And that's the space that they uh, they need our, our support and help. Um, addictions and mental health works on a, a tiered approach. They have, um, and Brian may have spoken of this. And so, you know, the, the programming that they do through mental health and addictions tends to focus on the higher tiers for uh, three to five, which is where you get the professionals who are working with those that are in more serious uh, situations. But the work where community work is done is just as important. And it allows us to really address uh, some of the, the, the issues before they actually hit crises. And so I think what the, the message I'm getting from uh, Brian and his colleagues is that there is a real need for partnership, collaboration, alignment, um, and building real synergies so that we can support them in uh, addressing the needs of our communities. And so I really get that sense that they want to work together and figure out new and innovative ways of building that capacity throughout Nova Scotia. So it's been really positive. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear. While we're on this topic, Kern, I wanted to zero in on a recently announced measure that the provincial government has taken, and it's been in the pilot project stage for about a year and a half now, uh, both mm. at St. Martha's Regional Hospital in Antigonish and the Cape Breton Regional Hospital in Sydney. The Rural Access to Urgent Care program, which does provide a virtual option in the event that a flesh and blood option isn't available for somebody needing immediate mental health attention. Your thoughts on this program and its efficiency in terms of being able to treat people in emergency situations? Yeah, I think I have a couple of thoughts and I, and I, I, we don't have a lot of data on it at this point, so I'm not sure, you know, how it's playing out, but um, you know, the one thing it does do is it allows, um, folks in communities, especially rural communities, obviously, to get access to uh, help and support sooner than later. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it because it is sort of a wraparound, the involved family and community and, and part of that process. Um, and so I think the ability to respond more quickly with, um, you know, the and addressing the needs more quickly is a good thing. Um, I think there's still pieces in the system that probably need uh, to be addressed. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, we've heard stories of people, you know, walking into emergency situations and feeling that they are presenting with a certain um, uh, characteristics of certain illnesses, but um, are being diagnosed differently. And, and there's some, you know, tension there. But I, uh, all in all, I think that the program is is a good one. It's I think it speaks to what they're looking to do is sort of new and innovative ways to access 
uh, you know, for uh, Nova Scotians to access mental health. So that's a great thing. The one, the one thing that I um, I'm curious about too is just um, there is we have to pay attention to this digital divide that exists in Nova Scotia as well. And uh, so it may not be as appropriate for those that don't have access to the internet or, or devices that will allow them to have access to the internet. And so we have to sort of keep that into consideration. Mm -hmm, definitely. So while we're on the topic of rural health care access, I know when I spoke to you last November, one of the things you really wanted to see action taken on was the idea of more health care options, more mental health care options for Indigenous communities across the province. What's your sense on how that's gone over the last year that you've been in charge of the Canadian Mental Health Association in Nova Scotia? It's a great question and uh, it's something that is a huge focus for us. Um, I think what we realized um, as we started out on this journey was that we traditionally had looked at healthcare for, from a very sort of colonial lens. And what we needed to do is actually look inside before we could act, do something uh, to, to move things forward. And so we've spent a, a fair amount of time uh, Looking inside, we've got uh, in a, kind of an internal committee, a Jedi committee, which is, uh, you know, addressing justice and equity and decolonization, diversity and inclusion. Um, and that that's going on at the same time. And we've been also intentional about doing outreach with uh, our our communities throughout Nova Scotia, Indigenous communities throughout Nova Scotia. We've uh, received funding to work with Eskasoni mental, uh, mental Health Services in providing them with assist training, which is really important. We are working with Member 2 and their youth uh, su peer support groups um, and, and sort of supporting those. And we have included um, uh, members, allies that we have uh, made along the way from uh, Indigenous communities on a lot of it are our advisory committees. Um, we've got some really terrific programming that's accessible and free, but we want to make sure that it's well informed. And so oh, those are the sorts of things that we're doing. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Is there more we can do? Absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, there, this is totally on my radar every single day and always looking for ways to open the door and, and create conversations and understanding so that we can continue to provide the service that these communities need in a really meaningful way. Now, we've been talking a bit about your organization's relationship with the provincial government. What can you tell me about how things are going with the federal government? It's been a year almost since yeah. we've seen the re-election of this particular government. What has that year been like for you and for your organization in terms of getting their support for mental health initiatives here in Nova Scotia? It is a focus as well. Um, it's something that uh, we look to our um, our federation to support us in they've got a very strong platform that really uh, articulates very very well sort of universal mental health and what that means to our communities i think that um it is uh tied to many of the same things that we are advocating for locally adequate funding uh reducing stigmatization, all of those things as well. So um, we tend to leverage our relationship with the, the Federation to get access. So in November, for example, um, all of the EDs from across the country uh, for CMHA will be going to uh, Ottawa for a couple of days to advocate on the Hill uh, on behalf of our provinces. So it, it's work that we're doing. Um, I would say that, you know, the provincial work is more in front of us, but uh, we work very, really well together with our sisters and brothers across the country to uh, work federally as well. We're winding down the conversation here, Kern, and yeah. I wanted to ask, what are some of the priority areas that you and your organization are looking at in terms of mental health over the next few months to the next year? What are you zeroing in on right now in terms of mental health delivery in Nova Scotia? Right. I think um, I, when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it sort of with, with two lenses. One is internally, um, because I do know that the only way that we can continue to do the work we do is that we do have to look internally and build capacity within our, our team. So in the past year, we've uh, worked really hard in community to build a strategic plan that reflects the needs of community. Um, and so I will be working with the team to kind of operationalize that and get it out into community. Um, we've got a number of programs that um, uh, address homelessness, uh, employment, uh, all of those things. And so each one of those is a piece in the puzzle that really allows us to build capacity and impact in the community. 
The other um, external kind of focus would be to continue to strengthen our relationships with our community partners, with government, um, to strengthen the collaboration that we're trying to nurture uh, with our partners as well, because we know that to build that capacity that, that we all need, we need to be able to um, align our efforts and, and know when we're, we, we're not needed in that particular lane and, and focus on the lanes that where we can really make impact. Uh, we're gonna continue to advocate for equity and parity in mental health, um, and uh, decolonization of the work and that kind of work. And really, about, it's really about creating safe um, communities where we can meet each other where we are with compassion and love. Honestly, at the, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. And all the activities flow from that. I just want to pick up on one last point with you. And one of the things that makes mental health delivery successful in any given community, large or small, is the public's embracing of the need for that to happen. And it feels mm -hmm. like perceptions on public health are changing slowly, but surely. What's mm -hmm. your sense of where we are now in Nova Scotia on the public's recognition of the importance of getting these services out there? I think, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, the public's always uh, believed and felt that, but they weren't really sure um, you know, what it should look like or could like look like and, and then, you know, how to push for the right changes to, to make it happen. Uh, what I'm noticing with government is uh, something that's really cool. And I, and I really, we talked about it a little bit last time, and that's the whole connection between mental health and the upstream impact of the social determinants of health. And what I've really appreciated about um, the government in the past, you know, 12 months almost, is that they are starting to break down the silos between departments. So for example, housing uh, and uh, mental health and addictions or addictions and mental health, you know, there's a direct correlation. So they, they've yeah. been calling, um, they've been calling meetings and uh, listening sessions so that they can actually really try and understand what those dynamics are. And so I think um, in, in terms of the public uh, and their understanding and their appetite for this, I think, they've always had it. It's just about how, you know, organizations and government are going to meet those needs in a really meaningful way so that they can navigate it and, and manage their own mental health journey or their own physical health journey in a way that's uh, uh, meaningful and accessible for them, ultimately. Hopefully so. We have covered a lot of ground in a short yeah. time, as I thought we <laughs> might today. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Karen? I just wanted to say thank you for inviting this conversation. I think uh, these conversations are super important in um, destigmatizing uh, the notion of mental health. The more we can talk about it, the more we can normalize the conversation, the better we'll all be in the long run, for sure. Yeah, I certainly agree there. It's mm -hmm. been a pleasure to speak to you and to hear about the direction that your organization is taking at this time. Thank you again, Kern Nichols, for joining me on Tell Ill 24-7 today. You are so welcome. <laughs> Karen Nichols is the Executive Director of the Nova Scotia Division of the Canadian Mental Health Association. We've been speaking to her from her home office in Hoobly today. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24-7 in just a moment. Many of you may remember that around this time last year, we did some special programming about mental health issues in Nova Scotia and about how people are dealing with their various issues and about getting treatment for those issues. One of the people that we spoke to is someone from West Arishat. He's Alex Forgeron. He has been dealing with mental health issues for many years, but it's only in the last 15 years that he's really gotten a handle on what exactly he's dealing with and how he needs to take care of it day by day. We are pleased to welcome Alex Forgeron back to the Telil Community Television Studios to help us with our special edition on mental health. Alex, thank you so much for joining us here on Telil 24-7 today. Thanks for having me, Adam. Good to be here. Good to have you back. First question, right off the bat, how are you these days? Well, I'm, uh, I'm actually really good. Uh, mentally, I'm in a good place. Uh, as I mentioned last time I was here, I got uh, three incredible uh, grandbabies, and uh, I can't complain at the moment. We often hear from people that have come from communities like this one about how in earlier times, even as recently as the 80s or 90s, 
that it wasn't easy to deal with mental health issues, that there were certain attitudes that have been passed down generation by generation about being stoic, about not complaining about your lot in life, about not dealing with these things, that it was all in your head. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've experienced that with some very specific things that have happened to you when you were growing up? Well, uh, of course, uh, my self-diagnosis, I guess, was uh, done later on in life. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as my actual mental health-wise, uh, my anxieties, my panic issues, um, I think that could stem from being, uh, I was a victim of sexual abuse as a, as a boy. Um, and back in the early, mid-70s, uh, as most people are aware, it's not something that was really talked about and brought to the forefront. And so uh, even myself, I had to keep it kind of buried, you know, as a boy because I was like, well, I may be the only guy this happened to. But of course, as I got older, I came to the realization that, hey, I can't be the only person. Mm -hmm. So I've been... Uh, I've become increasingly open about my situation and uh, I find it very therapeutic to speak to anybody, especially people that are in the same situation. To, uh, yeah, it just helps to make sense of it or try to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. How old were you when you felt like you could finally share this with someone? Was it many years after it had actually happened? Uh, what was uh, that journey like for you? Well, Adam, to be honest, uh, it happened probably, I might have been about 20 years old, 21. Uh, my daughter Kelsey was born and she came home from the hospital and I was an extremely proud father. But my wife Dawn started asking, you know, you're not participating very much in the care of our daughter. You know, you never want to change her, you never want to bathe her. So I broke down crying one day and I said, here's the deal. I was molested as a boy, and I, uh, not, I've never had any you know, bad thoughts about especially my own daughter, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to feel like I was violating her you know, by changing her diaper or giving her a bath, like stuff that a normal man, which I'm not abnormal, but you know, stuff that a person didn't go through a trauma mm -hmm. wouldn't consider being a bad thing. Yeah. You know, she's your daughter. Give her a bath, change her diaper, not a big deal. Routine. Yeah. And anyways, I, I had a really long, hard cry with her, and uh, she was the first person I opened up to, and like I said, it's about 30 years ago, give or take, and uh, from that point on, I'm, you know, I might be open book to a, to a fault, you know, I can meet a complete stranger and get into a conversation, and all of a sudden it comes up about uh, sexual assault or mental issues, and mm -hmm. I can tell somebody my own story that I don't even know their name yet. So that's, yeah, for me, that's where I'm at. Uh, Let's center back to that period when you did tell your wife shortly after your yep. daughter was born. <clears throat> did you seek out help to deal with the residual trauma from that event? You know, what was your pattern in dealing with this day by day once you had finally made that clear to her that that's what had happened? Well, Adam, uh, the way I've dealt with it, uh, I've always been a kid with a lot of imagination, and I feel that helped me a lot. I used to, you know, I watched a gazillion movies, uh, and I've always tried to be, I always tried to live my life through, a, through an actor, you know, uh, because as I told you before we started recording, uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish being me on anybody. Um, and not that I'm a bad person or whatever, but just, you know, going through your mind, or trying to live in my mind, I guess I would say. So basically, the long and short how I dealt with it, uh, I drank myself into oblivion. I gambled myself into oblivion. Uh, and it's only when I got into my mid-40s, well, early 40s to mid-40s, I guess, where I started seeking professional help uh, for my, you know, for, for, my, for my issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you went looking for that help, did you find it easily? Was, a, was it a long road for you to find someone professionally that could help you? Uh, it wasn't that difficult. Uh, the folks over at the, uh, at the office here, the doctor's office, uh, were incredible resources. And uh, at the current time, and again, I hope it doesn't uh, put a, 
a bad vibe to you, Scott, but uh, Scott McNeil is an incredible doctor, and uh, he's the guy I go to for my problems, and he's always there for me. Sometimes it just takes one medical professional yeah. that you can trust and that yeah. you can listen to, and that you know that they'll listen to you yeah. when you bring a problem like this to them. Yeah. How for much sure. do you feel what you experienced as a child still impacts you today. You've, you've mentioned you got into drinking. Uh, I yeah. know we talked about that last time you were here. Yeah. You gambled a lot of your money away and a lot of your life away. Yeah. Where do you feel you're at with it now? Is it a, <coughs> is it a daily struggle? Is it, is it something that is more under control for you now? What is it like today? Uh, the drinking is not an issue like it was. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I still have a beer now and again. But I hadn't drank in almost 11 years. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't seek that as a coping mechanism anymore. I derive a lot of a lot of peace from my grandkids, and uh, I'd like to say hello to Emmett, Aiden, and Rhett. Grampy loves you, boys. And uh, that's where I derive my peace from, and my uh, a lot of my strength, and. But it also made me very aware. Um, I'm a lot more protective, you know, of, of, of my grandkids and my kids more than I feel I was protected, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. But uh, for the most part, uh, I'm still broke. You know, gambling ruined me, you know, and uh, it is what it is. Uh, there are people that are a lot worse off. Uh, I still consider myself the wealthiest person I know. And you're still here. And let's, I'm, I'm still let's here. make that crystal clear yeah. that you are still here sitting in this chair to yeah. tell your story. Yeah. yeah. I'm definitely going down swinging. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned a little earlier about how you would really get into movies and you would try to emulate certain actors or try to show the confidence that they had. Yeah. Were there any one or two actors or movies that really inspired you at that point of your life? Well, I don't know if it was an inspiration more than a... Honestly, I think it was a desperate cry for a hero or, a, or something to look to that wasn't negatively impacted. Uh, I was like every other kid from my era, I guess. Uh, Stallone, Chuck Norris, mm -hmm. Jacques-Claude Van Damme, Seagal. Uh, they seem to have it all together. Yeah. Uh, now, with that being said, I also try to be, uh, I also try to bring a lot of comedy into my life, you know, when yeah. I'm around a lot of people. Uh, and Robin Williams said it best, you know, some of the funniest people on the outside are some of the more, or some of the most uh, unhappy people on the inside. And that really, I find, identifies me. Uh, I'm usually the, the, the loud guy in the room, and I try to make people laugh just to cover my misery. You know what I mean? In some in some respects. But like I said, my grandkids bring me so much peace and happiness that, you know, the good definitely outweighs the bad. Do you feel that the world that <clears throat> your grandchildren and your children are in now is more open and receptive to having the difficult conversations about mental health, about trauma, about PTSD than you might have found growing up yourself? Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, my my uh, my daughter suffered from uh, anxiety issues, and uh, so does my son. And uh, she's an incredible young lady. Uh, she's doing a great job raising her kids, as is my son. And you know, the the, the boys are only small, of course, but they'll they'll grow up in a place where if you have something bothering you, it's okay to tell me, and you know, we'll fix it. That's one of the most important things. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground in a short time here, yeah. and I thought we would, and I appreciate you being open and honest about your own story. Alex, did you want to add anything else just before we wrap up here? Uh, as I said last time I was here, uh, there are resources out there, and uh, you know, for people from the al area and surrounding areas, uh, if you have issues, I'm available to talk 24 hours a day, and uh, just don't give up, you know, keep fighting, and good things can happen. Yeah. Those are wise words and a great way to end. Yeah. Alex Forgeron, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much you. for being here and sharing your story with us. Thank you. 
And there you have it. Thank you for tuning in for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. We hope that this special edition on mental health has helped you in even a small way, and we encourage you to reach out to any of the organizations whose numbers you've seen rolling across the screen during the past hour to make sure that you, your family, your friends, or anyone you feel may have a problem with mental health gets the help that they need. Special thanks to my interview guests this week, Brian Comer, Karn Nichols, Alex Forgeron, and Tyler Shea. If you have any thoughts about what you've heard over the past hour, or just suggestions for future editions of Telil 24-7, feel free to contact me directly, or to reach out to Telil Community Television at the station in Arishat. And as always, feel free to follow Telil on social media. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this special edition of Telil 24-7. We'll return next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.